Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Johan Berger, and I'm the Business Development Manager for Executive Education at the College of Business Economics of the United Arab Emirates University. Um, this webinar today is part and parcel of our um, STEPS Forum, STEPS being the acronym for Seminars and Talks on Executive Education and Postgraduate Studies, which is our attempt to reach out to uh, the business community, addressing topics of interest um, for both scholars and business executives. Uh, today's topic is about something which is very crucial, not only for the business environment, but also for the uh, climate at, at, at large. Uh, the circular economy is not a new phenomenon, but it is a phenomenon that needs more support. We are seeing a growing number of startups and even large corporates addressing this topic of uh, dealing with waste and moving from a, the linear equation of produce, use, and waste to a circular equation of producing, using, but then instead of wasting, going into the field of uh, reusing, refurbishing, remanufacturing, recycling. Um, and in the process, diminishing the carbon footprint um, and the waste that we find are clogging up landfill sites, which in itself is something we would like to avoid. Some countries in the world, ladies and gentlemen, such as in Singapore, um, waste is being used to generate electricity. They recently commissioned their seventh um, waste to energy plant. Uh, huge continent such as Africa currently has two, one in Addis where it has a waste to energy plant and one in down in Cape Town where they take uh, waste and convert it into gas, which is then sold on to a retailer, which then obviously then um, retails the gas. In the Middle East and yeah, in the UAE, uh, renewable energy is not as pervasive as for example in um, Singapore, but we are seeing huge strides being made. Uh, dealing with waste per se, we have some of the organizations that are participating in this field with us today. We were fortunate to get on board three entities that are dealing with waste in various ways and means within the circular economy, doing good while doing good. Um, so I think without further ado, I will be introducing our first speaker to you, Mr. Yusuf Luta, who is the uh, CEO of Luta Biofuels. He's also the executive director of um, SSS Luta Group. He overlooks the strategic direction, expansion, and daily operations of Luta Biofuels in the UAE and internationally. Um, he has studied civil engineering and mechanical engineering and has an aeronautical certificate from Germany's Accentus um, Academy. He believes in self-learning and is always ready to learn and try new things. Um, his aim is to create more awareness about reducing carbon emissions with the goal to reach 70% of sustainable and renewable transportation in the GCC market by 2025. As it is, he is today in Saudi Arabia, where he is in Jeddah, actually working on the expansion of his um, enterprise going into the world of uh, transforming waste product into a useful bioproduct. Uh, Mr. Yusuf, thank you so much for your willingness to share your thoughts, the ideas, the challenges, the process that you faced over the past uh, decade or so in launching and developing uh, the company called Luta Biofields. Uh, can you start off by giving us an <clears throat> idea as to what drove you? Um, why did you start Luta Biofuels? Because the Luta group is a huge group and 
this is something which is not part and parcel of your normal operations. Uh, what made Yusuf Luta look at the world and say, we need to do something and I'm going to do the following. And then in the process also explain what Luta Biofuels is about. So first of all, uh, good morning, Mr. Johan. Good morning, all. Uh, your question was, uh, what led me to start the Luta Biofuel as a company? Uh, so I'll tell you, before I start the company, before, before all these leads, it was like my late father. Uh, when I was younger, he was, he was living in Dubai, but he was sleeping in the desert. Uh, he was working in the morning in Dubai, but he was leaving in the afternoon to, to stay in the desert. So I was asking him why and this, you know. So, so from that time, he was saying, Yusuf, in the city, the, the air is not clean. So, so, so from that day, uh, I saw him like, you know, every time I visit him to the, his desert camp, he was having solar panels. He was having like uh, biogas, you know, uh, to make it sufficient. And then after that, I saw him like, you know, having ideas about sustainable housing and all these things. So I was like, you know, uh, thinking and, you know, uh, so I, I, I believe it came from my family, especially from my late father, that uh, we need to take care of our planet Earth. We should not let it go and you know we have the uh the not clean air you know uh, mm -hmm. we should deserve we should deserve a better quality of life not for ourselves only but for our next generation uh so so i saw i saw at that time you know examples especially from europe uh there was some technologies about, you know, electrification, you know, mm -hmm. at that time, it wasn't like so much, uh, you know, advantage and, you know, it, it wasn't uh, technology like approved now, right now. Uh, and our family, one of our, our, our groups, uh, companies, you know, Luta BC Gas, they were doing projects of NGV natural gas vehicles for uh, for ad mm. so i was thinking and you know I, I was like exploring and all these things i saw the recycling of used cooking oil from a waste to an energy i i, had, I was like you know searching and you know uh, i saw this could be a potential then i went deep in it uh, my first let's say my first uh, demo, which I wanted just to prove to myself and to learn more about this. Mm. I, bought a, I bought a simple, uh, very small, let's say demo. Uh, I will not call it, you know, uh, refinery. I will call it like, you know, a demo lab stage uh, recycling. It's like a tank. It's called Biobot. And right. this was coming from, from UK. I still have it until now. Uh, it is it is a very small tank, you know. You basically, you just teach you how 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 you can produce biodiesel from used cooking oil. So so from that day, you know, I started to explore more more, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I I I I saw the recycling of the waste into an energy. This is like you know you are. Uh, doing good for the planet. We are doing good for for the for the air. Thank you, Mr. Yusuf. Now you need a source. You need a market. Uh, the principle is wonderful, but if people do not buy your product, and taking one step back, if you do not get raw material, you don't have a business. Um, where do you find your used cooking oil from? How do you convince people to start with reverse logistics. Instead of it going from the supplier to the retailer, you're now going from the retailer back to a supplier um, or a different kind of client in any case. So how did you convince the market to, 
to buy into that idea, first of all. And secondly, how did you create, this is a market for your raw material. And how did you create a market for your final product, the biofuels? Um, because again, if you don't have a, buy, a, a buyer at the end of that, then as the saying goes, you're a comedian without a punchline. Uh, so you're looking at two ends and, and you needed to bring both to the party. How did you manage that? I'll tell you, Johan, it was very, very hard. I'll tell you why. Uh, at, at that days, nobody knew about, in Dubai, nobody knew about the recycling and, and mm -hmm. the biofuels and even the use cooking oil and all these things. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll answer you in one word, uh, awareness. Okay. We, we have spent so much you know, time and money and let's say uh, all our, like, you know, we made, like, we, we were training the, the to the schools, you know, giving explanation to everybody about, about the biofuel. So I, I'll tell you, like, the biggest, let's say, challenge and uh, the biggest challenge and th that faced us is giving knowledge to the people, giving the awareness and to, to, to take care of their uh, waste, to take care of their uh, environment. Hmm. Okay. Um, and, okay, but that's now on, on, on the supply side. You're looking, you had to go physically to retailers, convince them that you would buy, um, because it also requires them to, to, instead of tucking it away, they know how to do something with the uh, vegetable oil that previously they didn't have the hassle with. Um, so you had to make it attractive for them instead of throwing it away to store it in their store somewhere and then to provide it with you. If you look, for example, at Nespresso, if I want to get rid of my Nespresso pods, I take it back when I go and buy my new uh, pods or my new, uh, uh, um, yeah, my new pods, I take back the used ones and uh, or when they come and deliver, they take back the stuff. How do you organize that? And if you could just also then briefly tell us about how did you convince your client, the person that buys your fuel? How did you convince them to instead of going the normal route of normal diesel and fuel, why buy biodiesel? How did you convince them? I know awareness, but if you could be a bit more specific, I would appreciate see, that. I, I will be more specific on this. To see, uh, if you want to have more clients, you need to have a client that you can reference them to, you know? Uh, you right. need to have a bigger client. So, so I'll tell you my story. Like, you know, I went and met the CEO of the bus transportation of RTA, Isa, Mr. Isa Dosseri. And I approached him about this idea. At that time, it was just an idea, you know? Yeah. So, so he told me, Yusuf, it is a great idea. It is a fantastic. I wish it could happen as soon as possible. But mm -hmm. before you do anything, I want you to do this project and win the DAS award, Dubai award for sustainable transportation. At okay. that time, this was like 10 years ago. No, maybe more, more, more than 20, 10 years ago. It was like 12 years ago, exactly, 12, mm. 2010. So, so after winning the award, after, after having a great example, I got RTA as a customer. RTA is like, like you know, the road and traffic authority yeah. of, of Dubai. They're the biggest. I'll tell you, they're the biggest fleet in, in Dubai. So I was fueling their vehicles. Okay. Also, we made a project with them. It was inaugurated by Sheikh Mohammed bin, uh, bin Rashid himself. It's called the Green Bus. Uh, it, was, it was this Green Bus was running by biofuels. Uh, it was uh, the tires were recycling material. Even the interior uh, seats and everything was like recycled, uh, recyclable material. It was full with solar panels. This project, we did it. And uh, let's say from that example, we, we, got, we got to give more awareness for the customers. Mm. I, remem I, remember, I remember those days we were having a tagline, you know, to get more customers. Mm. It was, it was, Sustainable, recyclable, and the third one, the most important one, is economical. Okay. 
you know as as a business we had to make it economical for the customer to be able to buy it right because because you know the customer if he if he can buy you know let's say uh biofuels or something you know which uh, benefit the environment he will be able to buy it one two three times but if it is not economical at, you know beneficial for him he cannot buy it for more time you know so we were pushing our limits you know to make it economical for the customer so f- from from that time until now you know we are you know happily giving you know our customers the good quality and the good service and also the economical way okay mr yusuf another question from my side typically speaking you need now to sell the fuel obviously um your large fuel companies uh, shell total whatever the case might be adnoc etc you would now be competing with their fuel how did you go about putting up stations fuel stations where people could come and buy your product did you have to develop your own were you able to convince the large fuel companies to also stock your fuel or you know what is the how did you go about being able to to retail the 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 biodiesel that you came up with did you have your so, own petrol uh, stations with other words hey see uh, we we were we were having a petrol not petrol stations yeah, I, I, I will call i yeah. will call it bio biofuel station yes and this biofuel station it is only business to business right uh, means means that you know we we get our our customer specific customer and then we we fuel them see it's not, it's not only from our uh, biofuel station we, no we deliver our material to their site we call it mobile tanker and uh, some of the customers having like generators some of the customers are having furnace and you know uh, all all you know different equipments that that use diesel so we have different type of customers and also we are not selling one product only we are selling like different kind of blends so some customers are asking for b100 which is like 100% biodiesel some of the customers are asking like b20 which is 20% uh, biodiesel so so it was like that i understand mr yusuf before we end off what were the challenges the main challenges you faced in this journey from an idea to a business that is now expanding not over not just within the uae but now expanding within um the gcc at large and even further what were the main challenges you faced what were the main problems you had to deal with the main challenges you know that we had is the awareness from the people i'll give you i'll give you a funny story my 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 first customer was my my elder brother uh, he he used he he have a hammer h1 which is like you know a, a truck diesel truck engine yeah. so, yeah. so i told him brother i will give you a biodiesel in your vehicle he told me yusuf are you crazy to the why he told me are you are you going to put burger king oil in my vehicle so it was you know he he it was funny that you know he didn't understand at that time but right now i'll tell you like after 10 years uh, having the company we are very happy and glad that you know it took time to create the awareness within the people and the demand is higher right now because people mm. are understanding you know the benefit of uh, sustainable mm. fuel uh, biofuels you know and uh, yeah. they knew they got to know these things they understand yeah. it right now so the big challenges was like was the main challenge i will tell you the awareness of the people which right. i i thank god that we have overcome this there are some other uh, different operational challenges which you know i'll tell you Uh, I'll tell to to the people that you will overcome these challenges by being keen and uh, you know just focused and believing in your idea. Right, Mr. Yusuf, thank you for that. I have a question for you, but I will ask it during the Q and A time at um, eleven o'clock our time and ten o'clock at your time. So please okay. don't stray or go away. There's a question yeah. here for somebody that would like. 
to know what would be your advice for um, our U uh, EU young students and that matter, it actually is for all the students within the UAE uh, looking for opportunities in the UAE market uh, and where many sectors are already saturated with international startups from transportation to tourism. So while we go on to the other speakers, you think about your advice you would like to give to young students for their startups. Uh, but thank you so yes, much uh, once again for your willingness to part of the fact that you are abroad to participate in our webinar this morning. It is much appreciated. So we will get back to you at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Yusuf. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is um, Ms. Anita Nuri, who is the CEO of GES, which is Green Energy Solutions and Sustainability and Solutions. Um, I'm not going to talk about her business because I think that is actually what she is yet today. Uh, Ms. Anita, thank you so much for your willingness to spend your time um, to explain to us how GES was brought about, the challenges you faced, and how it works and the process that you follow. Um, if I can just tell you that um, Ms. Anita has been a speaker at many events and she is highly uh, or being acknowledged for the work that she has, been, she has been doing. She has attained several awards for sustainable smart solutions. Um, GES itself is targeting landfills and providing environmental solutions uh, throughout the region. And as she says herself, as entrepreneurs, we are proud that the standalone project, this is GES, is setting the benchmark in the region for, for alternative energy. Uh, Ms. Anita, thank you so much. You are welcome to use the presentation. Um, and uh, if you can, I have um, allowed you to, to share your screen. Um, we look forward to the next 15 minutes listening to your story about GES. I'll unmute myself. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. And it's my pleasure and honor to be here and to speak, especially after speaking, um, uh, following Mr. Yusuf Luta, it's uh, an honor. And uh, what he's doing with the biofuels is uh, groundbreaking and it's important. And uh, as with all sustainable initiatives in this region, it takes um, awareness and education to be able to support that happening. Same with us. So I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm the CEO of Green Energy Solutions and Sustainability. It's uh, we pioneered the first landfill gas to energy project in the UAE, in the Middle East, uh, in Dubai, at the Al Qusais landfill, which is the largest landfill that's receiving still today. Um, up to seven, 8,000 tons of municipal solid waste a day. Municipal waste is your household waste. So I'm going to um, see if I can share my screen. And uh, you can hear me, right? Because I have an AC behind me. Is it loud? It's okay? I hear the AC. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Um, there you go. Wait. So there it is. There it is. You can see this. We can see. Okay. So circular economy and waste management, which means being able to close the loop. So we're going to use the Kusais landfill as a case example. As you can see on the left side of your screen, that's what the landfill looked like in 2011 when we came here at the, at the beginning. It was a dump site. It was, um, um, to be polite, a little bit smelly and not very well uh, controlled. There were pickers on site and they were picking the waste randomly and working with Dubai municipality and having the opportunity to work with at the time the director general was His Excellency Hussein Nasser Luta um, and his vision of trying to bring sustainability into um, the region. Waste management, we felt waste was a place where there was 
uh, an opportunity to be had. And what was a dump site is now award-winning recognized project that is reducing methane emissions equal to over 300,000 tons of CO2 emissions a year. Um, the landfill is uh, uh, sustainable because we are covering the waste. There is no more smells, very little smell. There are no more fires and there are no uh, random pickers crossing across the landfill. And we've always worked in cooperation with the municipality to try and enable this landfill to remain um, a positive impact in the region until the time comes that we can close it and reach our net zero targets. So just as a little bit of background, and I won't go too deeply into this, but uh, landfill potential of harnessing this waste energy uh, globally, uh, landfills generate gas and the gas uh, powers an engine and that engine powers the uh, surrounding areas and facilities. In this region, uh, we are only powering ourselves and the municipality site offices and uh, all the electricity that you see, like I'm sitting at the site office right now and the fact that I have power and I'm being able to speak to you is all done by the gas that we're capturing off of the landfill. We have a one megawatt engine on site and that engine is providing the power. The potential of this landfill is much larger. Um, regionally speaking, it has been a challenge because you asked me what our challenges have been. And it has always been a challenge for us to be uh, grid connected with our power because we need um, uh, proper legislation and regulations and the ability for DIWA to sign a power purchase agreement with us. And this has been a, a little bit of a challenge. We started uh, early uh, in 2011-12, uh, even with our project registered with the United Nations under CDM. In those days, there were no SDG goals. So even that has presented itself uh, in COP26 by stopping our um, CDM because all projects registered prior to December 2012 did not qualify anymore. And our project was registered November 2012. So those two weeks um, sent me another little, uh, let's say, love arrow. <laughs> and uh, cool. something that Mr. Luta said, you have to be passionate and believe in yourself and keep going because in front of every success, there will be many, many doors that close, but you need to look for the windows and the cracks and how to get in there because it's important what we're doing. It, uh, sustainability and making um, sustainability easier and economically feasible is what our challenge is now. So definitely we can harness this waste energy. You can see from the graph that methane CH4 is around 50, 60% of the gas, and that can go into a combustion engine uh, and it produces power. This is the site today. You can see it. This is a picture taken from the top of the landfill. You see the two flares that are, um, with I put the arrow on them. Each of these uh, flares can take 3000 cubic meters an hour. And this little white um, uh, is the engine, the container that has our engine. And that's this. This has a, a Yenbacher J320. It's a one megawatt landfill gas engine. The Cousse's site is capable of over 20 megawatts an hour of base load power. Um, and for me, I think that uh, this power can be either connected to the grid or utilized uh, internally if you have industry that's close by or on site. And uh, this is where our next uh, phase is and what our next challenge is. You can also crack methane uh, for hydrogen and since hydrogen fuel is a, a new target, let's say, for the region, we're hoping that maybe we can 
uh, investigate this. And as a byproduct of cracking methane, you can get graphene. And graphene and a nano is uh, uh, not something new, but it's something that can support um, development regionally and globally to reduce the amount of rebar you need in cement. It can um, be as a fire retardant. It can be as a coating for helping um, cool uh, temperatures. It can be used in uh, battery technology and it can be transported um, out of this world to other planets to help with building um, because we come and live in an area that, uh, in a region that celebrates innovation and wanting to build a new mall of the Emirates on the moon could be possible with uh, graphene. <laughs> so that's my uh, crazy vision. A circular economy, of course, um, means how to reach sustainability and sustainability needs to be easy um, we need to be thoughtful. Plastics comes to mind because plastics, I see it so often. We think we are recycling, but we actually are um, not doing the best that we can do. And we need to do better so that we can reach that best. And you can see in these pictures, the recycling that's happening on site really less than 5% is being recovered because the plastic waste, once it's contaminated, there isn't much that can happen to it. And that water bottle that you throw away without thinking is ending up in the landfill or even these bags, you can see it in that bottom picture, will live there for 500 years. We will be judged in history by what we are doing today. Can we reduce it and can we reuse it we absolutely can. Do we really need bags? Um, Abu Dhabi took a bold step and actually stopped plastic bags. Dubai is um, also leading the way by um, uh, charging for plastic. But in reality, we should not take plastic bags. Even the biodegradable ones is, um, to me, false advertising because um, once you bury them in a landfill, they're not biodegradable anymore. They only will degrade if they're out in the sun and in the oxygen. So keeping it simple, I will keep repeating this because only if it's simple and only if people understand that it's achievable, can we bring this awareness and education and actually make the change happen. So as I mentioned, um, CDM, uh, our project was registered under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, even though that has uh, failed us uh, to a certain extent, the fact that SDGs were not connected to it failed it more on a global um, platform. But there are other standards out there and available. Vera is one of them. This is for plastic waste reduction. And any type of plastic that you can divert away from landfills and you can quantify that, and you can reuse that plastic, then you can monetize it. And these credits from plastic recycling, reuse, diversion are trading right now somewhere between the two to 600 US dollars a ton price, which um, again, if people are aware of it, especially the larger corporates, they can use this and use these credits and monetize it and be able to do more. Because um, if sustainability is tied to economics and it's costing too much to be sustainable, then companies that have shareholders that are dictating to them what profits need to be, then sustainability gets thrown off to the side. And this is where I want to bring some uh, knowledge and recognition and understanding that there are things that can be done and we should actually know what our carbon footprint is. We should know what we're doing. And if we know it and we quantify it and it gets verified, 
then you can probably monetize it. And we're always open to discuss this with anyone that has um, questions. <clears throat> All the plastic, you can see these bottles. What is net zero? I think that the word zero scares people when in actual fact, it only means that if the carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere is balanced with the carbon that you're reducing from the atmosphere, you're at net zero and you're not stressing the planet. And this is where our challenge lies. It's how to achieve balance and net zero. Are they lofty goals? Um, <clears throat> I don't think so. I think that we can achieve it before the 2030 and 2050. Uh, obviously, there are government incentives out there. There are drivers. There is, um, uh, you know, uh, initiatives that can support it. And we just need to be bold enough and um, do it. We just need to do it. Think about it. Why? Why? I mean, here I am very badly drinking out of a water bottle because I'm at the landfill site where we don't have fresh running water. But I, I will not throw this bottle in the garbage. I will put it in a proper recycling bin and I will put it in a bin that I know goes to a recycler who we are working with some of them who are quantifying it and hopefully the right thing will happen. But we also need to understand that this plastic bottle has three types of plastic on it. So what type of plastics are recyclable? What are the best ways and what other places are doing? What are other countries doing? And we need to uh, share that knowledge. We need to open the doors and discussions like this and a platform that is far reaching is important because it makes people start to think and ask the questions. And it's only by asking the questions that you will get your answers. So again, community awareness. So far we've all been saying this and uh, education and all of that equals action. So we, we uh, invite many students on site. We have a lot of schools that come on a regular basis. University of San Francisco in California has come every year for the past five years and they bring MBA students to come and see the landfill to see what we're doing <clears throat> to show how um, proud we are to be working with uh, uh, and working in a place like Dubai and with Dubai municipality that um, wants and supports action and they really want to bring awareness and uh, end up closing the landfill hopefully with the incineration plant coming up and with proper uh, covering of the waste that's here one day we can turn the Kusais mountain into a green mountain and and do something nice with it so there are recycling centers there are places you can take your waste if you don't have it in your building or you don't have it where you live you can call the hotline you can call the municipality ask them where to go you can call the waste collectors and you can even google it like don't be scared to ask the questions no question is ever a wrong question and it's important to know what you can do and what is available to you we lead by action and hopefully we're taking the right action and we have to speak up to have a voice if you don't speak up then you have no right to criticize you have to be part of the game to be in the game uh, these are all little buzzwords, but they're true. Um, if we go back in history, every change that happened had many people that were uh, negative against that change until that change became business as usual. Um, what comes to mind for me is the ATM machines, the bank machines. When they first came out, in the 70s, everyone was scared to put their money into that little slot because they thought it would disappear. And 
now it's even normal and now we don't even put it there it's on our phone and we use our phone to tap and pay for everything so the world is changing faster than we realize my uh i mean what the world was when my grandmother was young and what it was when i was young and what it is today for my children and grandchildren it's incredible at the pace that we're growing and if we don't do something to support change then we are going to be in trouble and uh it, the it, it's clearly out there we need to listen think and take the right action cop 28 being in the uae is incredible i look forward to it and hopefully um be able to be part of that mm -hmm. and um i think that uh uh I'm a, I'm a born optimist, but I am optimistic for our future. And um, I speak, and like <laughs> Professor Johan said, I speak at a lot of panels and I like to inspire people. I like to motivate, especially young women to get into the industry. Uh, construction is a male dominated industry, but it doesn't mean there is no place for women. I think women have a strong voice and I think uh, working together is a smart way to work because women and men think differently. And together we can think a little bit better and hopefully make the world a little bit better place and a little more sustainable. And um, I'll share this with you later and uh, Professor Yohan can put it up uh, for the people and you're welcome to email me and ask uh, any questions that you um, uh, would like to ask. And that's basically my presentation for today. So. Anita, thank you so much. That was very interesting, very practical, very specific, um, very important message to get across and explanation about the net zero. Thank you for that. Um, we, again, we will have a few questions for you towards the end. Um, so uh, we look forward to, to your responses then. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. Nicholas Colvert, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ceramic Materials, which is a UAE-based startup company, um, which is pioneering in um, recycled ceramics. He's also assistant professor in mechanical engineering at the Mazdar Institute, the Khalifa University here in Abu Dhabi since 2013. He's the founder and chair of the Mazdar Institute solar platform, which is the first facility in the UAE dedicated to concentrated solar power and thermal or, um, energy storage research and development. He also represents the UAE at uh, the Solar Paces Executive Committee, which is the technology collabor collabor collaboration program from the International Energy Agency. He has a, BS, a Bachelor of Science in Physics, a Master of Science in Solar Energy, um, and a PhD in engineering science, energy and environment, also from France. Um, I think without further ado, uh, Dr. Nicholas, we look forward to your talk, um, explaining to us your, um, the lessons that you've learned from your process, um, startup at uh, ceramics. I find it a very interesting uh, uh, concept and uh, I look forward to your explanation. Over to you. Thank you, Johan. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm going to go through my journey from research to the creation of the startup, uh, knowing that at this stage we are still in the, let's say, uh, demonstration of our concept. We are not yet uh, sustainable in terms of revenue. But um, this is a very long journey when you start from an ID from scratch and you need to uh, go to the commercialization. So everything, let me introduce the, the topic first. Uh, I was born in France in 1979. And at the same time, uh, this uh, concentrated solar power plan that I will call CSP um, was built at the same time, it's called TEMIS. And it was one of uh, the first uh, demonstration of what we call now the conventional two tank molten salt technology. So as you can see on this picture, you have a set of mirror that we call heliostat. 
And so the heliostat reflects the light at the top of a tower where you can reach very high temperature. And the concept is to recover this heat. And once you have heat, it's very simple to create steam for a turbine and generate electricity on demand. However, you need to store solar energy during day when you have a lot of sun to reuse it at night, of course, when you don't have sun, uh, because we all need electricity at night, right? So this was in the uh, 70s. And then we have to wait 2011 uh, to see uh, this technology commercialized by Mazdar, Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, and Sener, a Spanish engineer company. So this plant is called Gema Solar. It's located in Seville, and it, it produces about 20 uh, megawatts of electricity. But the particularity is that it's the first one that generates electricity 24 hours, even at night. Um, so basically, the, the concept is simple. You have uh, two tanks. One is called cold tank, but in reality, it's relatively cold compared to the hot. So you have nitrous salts that are used as a heat transfer suite and storage media at the same time. So these nitrates, I will show you some picture after. It's uh, a fertilizer that is used in agriculture. And um, when you heat up this uh, solid, it will become a liquid, almost transparent like water, and you can pump it. So you, pump, you melt it at 220 degrees Celsius, and then you pump it at the top of the tower. It will circulate in pipes where the light is concentrated, and that's how you collect the heat. And you can uh, heat up this molten salt up to 600 degrees Celsius and bring it back in the hot tank. And at night, when you don't have sun, you just pump the hot salt, go to a heat exchanger, produce a steam for the turbine, and bring back the uh, relatively cold salt in the cold tank waiting for the next day. So this technology is mature. It's uh, uh, the, the, the most used technology in the world in terms of uh, thermal energy storage. You have the biggest tower that is uh, completed now in Dubai, 260 meter high. Uh, it's called Noor, and um, it's using this technology. So the question is, um, what are the challenges? What can we do? Well, the, the problem of molten salt, so you can see here how it looks like at a room temperature. Uh, as I told you, it's, it's a fertilizer we use in agriculture. And uh, on the picture at the top right, you can see the big two tank. So you have to imagine it's 36 meter in diameter, 14 meter high. So it's huge quantity of these salts that, that are required to store energy. So what are the challenges? The, the main problem of molten salt is that it's limited at 600 degrees Celsius. So you cannot use it above this temperature. And uh, as you know from the Carnot uh, cycle, the highest the temperature, the highest the efficiency from heat to electricity. So the, the scientific community is trying to work at higher temperature in the range of 800 to 1,000 degrees Celsius, where we usually use a gas turbine. For example, um, there is a a big, big um, development in the US on a super critical CO2 turbine, for example. So if you want to use uh, molten salts in this range of temperature, it's not possible because your salt will be degraded. So we need alternative material to um, store heat at very high temperature in the range of 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius. And that's where is starting my journey. So I did my PhD in France from 2007 to 2010. And I, um, I was trying to find material that could be used at this level of temperature. And of course, materials that are available all over the world in large quantity and, uh, if possible, uh, affordable. And so my uh, director of um, uh, uh, PhD, who is at the backside here in the picture, got the idea of looking into industrial solid waste. Why industrial solid waste? Because they are available all over the world, they are cheap, they are um, 
we need to find solution to recycle this waste. So we started to look into asbestos containing waste in France. As you know, asbestos was used in a building as insulation uh, before the 70s. And then we discover that asbestos is dangerous for health, as you can inhale the fiber that are that give cancer. So we started to remove asbestos from buildings, and we end up in France with 250,000 tons of asbestos containing waste per year. And so uh, you don't have several solutions. Either you landfill this waste, but it's still dangerous. Uh, if somebody opened the bag, you, you will have some uh, asbestos all over the place. Uh, or you treat this waste at high temperature and you destroy totally the fiber that are dangerous and you obtain um, a, a product called cofalit, And that's uh, the ingot you can see here on the picture. And so during my PhD, I demonstrated that this uh, byproduct is a ceramic that can store heat up to 1,200 degrees Celsius. And that is very cheap because to be honest, they don't have uh, many application for that. They use it as aggregate for road construction and they sell that about $10 a ton, so almost nothing. So when we demonstrate that this waste could be recycled in value added application, in energy application, then we started to think, hmm, that seems to be a good business because if you take something that costs $10 a ton and you sell it maybe $1,000 a ton, um, you can make uh, a profit, of course, but also make something good for the planet because you are recycling this waste. So then I moved to US and later to Spain and I continued to uh, look for different industrial solid waste we could recycle. I visited Gema Solar in 2011, and uh, that's the reason why I'm here in UAE now, uh, because I learned about Mazdar, and uh, I was very fascinated by this project. And so I decided to apply to Mazdar Institute, and in 2013, I became professor, assistant professor in, in Mazdar Institute, which later merged with Khalifa University in 2017. And in 2019, we decided to create the startup company to commercialize our different product. So uh, before going to um, the startup, I created the Mazdar Institute Solar Platform, which is the first facility in the UAE, dedicated to concentrated solar power, but more importantly, to thermal energy storage. And we have tested different material that could store heat starting from desert sand, uh, metal alloy, molten salt, and concrete. Um, and in uh, 2018, uh, we um, submitted our first patent on a recycled ceramic. So the, the ceramic you see on this picture are made out of uh, Emirates steel uh, slags. So Emirates steel is a steel factory in Musafa in Abu Dhabi. They produce mainly um, high beam for construction. And when they melt the steel in the electric arc furnace, all the impurities are going at the, the surface of, the, of this um, molten steel. And that's a, a waste called slags. So you will cast the steel to make your high beam and then you will cast the slags. And again, they don't know what to do with the slags they are using it as aggregate for road construction. And so we demonstrated that this slag could be shaped into a ceramics and that can store heat at very high temperature, uh, let's say above 1000 degrees Celsius. So starting with this five patent, one of them is granted in, in China now, um, we decided to create the company. And so, we create ceramic material with S, which is an acronym for Sustainable Energy Recovery and Manufacturing Industrial Ceramics. And our idea was to start from the industrial solid waste and produce a value-added ceramic product that could be used in um, technical ceramics, such as energy storage, but also in construction materials, such as bricks, tiles, etc. 
Today, we have over 10 years of know-how and expertise on this uh, domain, and we have 12 patents, um, well, let's say 11 patent pending and one granted. So why are we relevant? We are talking in the world of 1 billion tons of industrial solid waste every year. And of course, this leads to waste management issue, environmental issue, and um, cost of disposal, which is an issue for uh, uh, several industry. So I mentioned already steel slags, but uh, one of the waste I'm the most proud of is more municipal solid waste incinerator or bottom ash. Why? Because recently BI and Mazdar um, inaugurated their first incinerator in Sharjah. And so all the household waste in Sharjah will be burned to make electricity, about 30 megawatt. However, when you burn household waste, between 10 to 20% of the uh, household waste will remain as a bottom ash. And so in Charja, we are talking about 150 ton a day of ash to be um, land, mainly landfilled. So uh, we have demonstrated that this ash could be used in um, construction materials. And so we have several patents on this. So um, this is an example of circular economy where all our waste will end up into construction material, which is I believe uh, a better approach than landfilling. So we have developed uh, the first laboratory in the GCC country dedicated to industrial solid waste valorization. So we are located in the tech park in Mazar city. And there we are able to go from the as received waste to the shape ceramic and the final product. So we have, thanks to this lab, we have developed several products. And our first product is called Rising Ceramic Flora. Why flora? Because it looks like a flower. And so we have designed this product in, in uh, Abu Dhabi, of course. And we have manufactured it in France uh, during COVID um, by finding a ceramic factory that has some, let's say, inactivity period where we can use their factory to manufacture our product using our formulation. So if you, if you compare our first product to uh, what is available on the market, for example, Saint-Gobain is a French company leading the technical ceramic. Um, they sell their products at least around $2,000 a ton. And in our case, we are able to commercialize it around $1,000 a ton. So we are able to cut by 50% the cost of ceramic just by using the waste as a raw material. And that's really the, the key in, in this uh, development uh, because usually when you recycle, the product is more expensive. In our case, it's less expensive because we don't have to mine the raw material that is very expensive. We replace this raw material by waste that is locally generated. And that's uh, the, the key in, the, in getting a product that is cost effective. In terms of property, of course, we don't have uh, similar properties than, for example, alumina, which is a pure ceramic, but we are able to reach 1,250 degree, which is more than enough uh, for the application we are targeting. I mentioned uh, in my introduction, we are targeting between 800 and 1,000 degrees Celsius. So the fact that we use a waste as a raw material doesn't penalize us in the final application because we are already above the targeting temperature. So we already uh, produce uh, 30 tons of our material and uh, we sell it to a first company called Store Energy. It's a, a company from uh, Serbia and they are testing 24 tons of our material in uh, south of Spain in the Plataforma Solar de Almeria. So you can see on the left the concentrator that concentrate the light and create heat. Uh, this heat is collected using hot hair and the hot hair will circulate in the pack bed where we have our material. So basically during day, the hot hair will transfer the heat to the ceramic and at night, 
uh, we do the contrary. The relatively cold air will come and recover the heat from the ceramic to continue to produce electricity. So this is a, a, a first uh, achievement for us because the client is very happy with our uh, material and already asked for quotation for more quantity for a commercial project. And uh, another client is a startup company in California called Eliogen. And this is the first uh, CSP company backed by Bill Gates. So Bill Gates wants to save the planet, as you know, and um, he wants to replace uh, fossil fuel in heavy industry. So when we talk about cement, glass, uh, aluminum, steel, all these heavy industries that burn gas to melt the material, he wants to replace by using concentrated solar power. And of course, at night, you don't have sun, so they need to store this heat at very high temperature. So at the time we talk, they are um, testing our photons of our product, and we are um, really happy to have uh, such a prestigious client in our uh, portfolio. Uh, finally, I would like to mention that um, all this work related to thermal energy storage was highlighted uh, during the Expo 2020 in the UAE Pavilion. So it was a, a real honor to be selected among 20 innovation in the country um, and uh, showcase our products uh, at the Expo 2020. And with this, I'm done with my presentation and I will be pleased to answer any question in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. That was extremely interesting. I was thinking while you were talking, eventually, you know, how do we use this um, flora um, ceramic and uh, a wonderful application. So, uh, you know, it's, it transformed the pro problem of having a, a, um, a challenge at night. If you don't have a battery and at utility scale, it's difficult to have enough batteries to store the electricity from generated from solar from wherever and to use it at night at a micro and a nano level by all means, but not really on utility scale. So this can be something which I think the rest of the world can actually embrace. So we will get back to you. Uh, before I introduce Professor Pan, I think I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Yusuf Luta. Um, he unfortunately needs to leave us at, you know, within the next 15 minutes. Um, uh, Mr. Yusuf, are you still on the air? Right, I would like yes, to get you, I would like to ask you the question before I hand over to Professor Pan. Um, the one question that we had, uh, which I asked you as a young Emirati entrepreneur, what is your advice to uh, our young students within the UAE looking for opportunities in the market um, where they have to compete with uh, international startups ranging from transportation to tourism? Um, what advice would you have for them? Uh, uh, I've seen and I've heard, you know, that you need to persevere, you need to start. Um, I think it was Ms. Anita that said, you need to be passionate, you need to believe in yourself, you need to keep going. Um, what would be your advice to the youngster saying, I want to do something, but I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know with what? So, um... My answer for that is uh, I believe in this century uh, and, and in the coming years, technologies are enhancing very much and very fast. So, so I suggest to the young uh, future entrepreneurs uh, that they don't look for this year or the next year, but they have to look above. You know, they have to look more. They have to look 10 years from now. Mm. Uh, Technologies are, in, are, are, are getting better and better. And, and uh, I'll tell you, like, future is bright. So they have themselves to look into the market and to mm -hmm. see the opportunities and the potential for the future. And they can work on it right now. And they, it will be fruitful after many years. Great. Mr. Yusuf, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your willingness to, to share your time with us, despite the fact that you are involved in negotiation and meetings um, abroad. Um, I really appreciate your willingness to share everything that you've done with us. 
Um, all the best with your negotiations. And um, I look forward to you talking and working with you sometime again in, in the near future. Thank you. I would like to thank, I would like also to thank uh, Ms. Anita about the wonderful presentation. Uh, I believe I met her in the inauguration of uh, the landfill project uh, with, uh, with His Excellency, Mr. Hussein. And I would like to also thank Dr. Nicholas about his presentation. And I would like to thank you all guys. And uh, we am, I, am, I am pleased to invite you to visit our new plant in Dubai Industrial City uh, for the students and to, to learn more about the biofuels in details. Thank you very much, all. I will be there before you know it. Thank you. Definitely have to. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Right. You have a great day. Same to you, Mr. Yusuf. It is now my privilege to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Shan Alpan, who is an AGSM scholar and deputy head of the School of Re head of School and for Research at the School of Information Systems and Technology Management at the University of New South Wales Business School. Um, his research um, research interests include. Um, ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance uh, strategies, the circular economy, and decarbonization transformation. He's the founding director of the Digital Sustainable Sustainability Knowledge Hub, which specializes in the research and education of digital sustainability. In addition, he's the inventor of an ESG intelligence system, which I find fascinating, that tracks leading business organizations ESG strategies and greenhouse gas performance. Um, Professor Pan, we look forward to your, to your talk. Uh, we've placed him at, towards the end, ladies and gentlemen, so that you could also um, in, you know, uh, uh, summarize and uh, talk about the presentations of our three um, uh, entrepreneurs and, and give his views on that. I've also asked him that to also uh, where he has uh, an interest to ask questions to these entrepreneurs um, to enlighten us as the audience further. Professor Pan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, I'll open up the slides. Um, thank you. Thank you, Johan, for the uh, introduction and, uh, and also the opportunity to, uh, to share what I'm doing uh, here in Sydney. Um, we are now in winter and I've got a heater uh, just at the back of, of my chair uh, and uh, it's a fantastic um, opportunity to be with, uh, with the panel. Um, uh, I can see that um, there's a lot of interesting entrepreneurial efforts coming along and uh, I was taking a lot of notes. I was, you know, I was uh, looking at the pictures and find it uh, fascinated. Uh, really fascinating to uh, to be on the same panel. Um, I want to take uh, things um, a little bit um, uh, different from the perspective of uh, of the entrepreneurs uh, who are actually out there, you know, uh, inventing and producing product. Uh, so, so uh, being a business school professor, um, I have the privilege of looking at what business organizations are doing. Uh, and, and, and I think we all know that in the last few years, um, there's been a lot of interest in, 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 in concepts like ESG, circular economy, and net zero, carbon neutrality, and things like that. Um, so there has been a lot of, um, um, uh, um, not just, just in terms of media interest, but also uh, consumers. There's a lot of consumers asking key questions. Uh, they're buying green products. They're asking, they're asking questions about circularity. They're, they're asking questions about carbon neutrality and, and footprints and, and carbon offset, uh, carbon you know, exchange and things like that. So, um, so basically that's, that's been um, the area of interest that, I, that I'm looking at. And basically I'm looking at how organizations uh, in, 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 in most cases are the commercial organizations uh, we're looking at how, uh, you know, how, how do they go about strategizing and undertaking what, what we now uh, are hearing more and more, um, the concept of decarbonization transformation, right? So I think, I think this is really the background of uh, my work and, uh, and 
uh, I'll take this opportunity to to sort of uh, share with you um, um, a, a ESG intelligence systems that were built and how we have used it to uh, help organizations to make strategies, you know, in terms of strategy making, strategy planning, uh, as well as how we use it in, in our classrooms, in training MBA students and, and some of the uh, uh, senior, senior uh, students or learners that come to us. I think, I think one of the starting points, uh, as far as uh, ESG initiatives and decarbonization um, transformation activities and initiatives are concerned, is this whole notion of what what have they been doing? Right? Uh, what are some of the what are some of the initiatives? What are some of the challenges? What are some of the the areas that they are covering? Right? Um, ESG again stands for environmental, social, and governance. Right? So it's a good a uh, good set of indicators that more and more um, in terms of investment, in terms of financial market, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, government, in terms of uh, organization or themselves, organizations themselves are using this set of indicators to 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 monitor, to to measure, and to to strategize um, what will be considered as strategies of the future uh, as we as we approach. Um, the, the, as we approach the next 20 years, as far as the green economy goes, as far as circular economy goes. Um, and so, so we became really interested in, in looking at the data. Um, there's been a lot of talks about what companies are doing. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of um, if you were, um, PR and, and greenwashing in some cases. And, and, and there are companies and executives who got into trouble uh, for producing, uh, uh, you know, uh, green, you know, uh, the data, uh, put, uh, producing reports and, and, and over claiming what they're doing in the ESG space. So um, we got interested in, 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 in that and we wanted to uh, see what companies are doing and how they are doing. And we wanted to observe and we wanted to track and to some extent measure uh, what they have been doing in this space. So ESG data was really our starting point. Um, so, sorry. So the system uh, that we built, um, initially we, we had wanted to build it for um, MBA students, right? So we, we, we started off uh, uh, in this system and in this system, what it does is, is that it, it, it not only provides opportunities for corporate training, um, it also allows company to uh, to really uh, make uh, strategies and to really uh, uh, be able to visualize what they have done and what other companies are doing or have done. And so this is really the the basis of our 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 uh, system. And um, it, it includes um, it uses uh, technology such as machine learning, AI, and and and, and a lot of predictive and, and, and analytics. And also, um, uh, we're also uh, crawling some of the data from from real time so social media mentions and things like that. So we use this particular uh, 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 this particular function uh, to really track uh, what what leading organization organizations are doing in in the context of uh, ESG, and more particularly, we looked at what they have made publicly uh, available disclosure. The, the disclosure they have made, and we um, we picked up we picked up their disclosures, on, and and this has been now more than a year's uh, effort, and we now have about ten thousand uh, ESG initiatives, and this is covering um, close to hundred companies now, uh, and 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 the the, uh, the initiatives are also coming from um, ten different industries, so this is what we would uh, consider as an ESG, uh, a screenshot of our, our ESG tracker. It basically tracks what companies have done. And we also have a particular function that that analyzes what they haven't done. And so this allows organizations to, to look at what they have done and, there are, and also opportunities that they can take on, right? So uh, we have, we have, uh, we, we looked at, uh, we look at three different international standards. And, and so users, especially, uh, you know, students, uh, our MBA students are extremely happy that they can browse around from company to a company and so on. And they can learn from 
other companies' uh, best practices, and I can also uh, I look at how different companies from different industries are doing in, 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 in say, for example, in the specific uh, space of economic or environmental or for that matter, social. Uh, so let's just take an example. Uh, the system allows uh, the user to click on energy and it will display what this particular company has has done uh, in, a, in, in, in the category of energy. And in, in another function that we, we, we have would, would, would also highlight the category that the areas that this particular case company hasn't done. Uh, and we, the system then uh, uh, is then capable of uh, making recommendations of what other companies have done in the same area uh, and make them available uh, for the user or for the company team, for, for the sustainability team of the company uh, to learn from and to 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 um, uh, to to benchmark and as well as to uh, do analysis of. So this is an example of uh, of our benchmarking function. So we could literally pull up two companies uh, and put them side by side, uh, and we can you know we we, we uh, the uh, the users can 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 browse around and to to see what what the other company is doing well. For example. Uh, you know, so how how you know so they have all this coverage in terms of initiatives. So each of these items will be an initiative, and 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 how, for example, Company B uh, for the same year 2020, um, you know, is, is not doing as well, and so they can learn from uh, each other. All right, so that's really the what the benchmarking feature function can do. Uh, we also have the uh, uh, a tracker that that allows. Um, allows um, uh, allows the user allows the yeah allows the user to pick up what different companies are doing uh, in terms of their greenhouse emissions. Uh, again, this is this this is based on uh, publicly disclosed um, data, uh, and there's a, there will be a lot of um, uh, you know the the user can play with the uh, can play with the the uh, the numbers. Uh, we also have a online calculator. Uh, that allows the user to to make uh, prediction and to plan uh, in terms of the the, uh, the the emissions in terms of the breakdowns of the emissions and the breakdowns of the three different scopes when we talk about carbon emissions. So it is a it is a system that allows users to interact uh, and to also plan. Um, again, you can pull up two companies and you can put them side by side, and this provides a lot of information. Uh, um, on on if you, you can compare two companies from the same industry, or you can uh, you may may want to compare across industries. Uh, but but this system allows um, uh, uh, what the system will do is that it will uh, link it will link the carbon numbers, the carbon emission numbers, uh, to a function that we built uh, a a carbon offset calculator, uh, which I will show you. Uh, so this is a GHG calculator. So this is for the user to learn and to to uh, to play with the uh, the emission standard. Um, uh, sorry, the the emission numbers. Um, I mean, our audience may or may not have uh, heard, but uh, going forward, uh, any company will be responsible for uh, three scopes of emissions, and in particular, scope three. Uh, which the bulk of it would, would would have come from suppliers, right? So in other words, uh, companies, any company, uh, let's say a tech company, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft, uh, uh, Microsoft would be responsible uh, for their suppliers' uh, carbon emissions. So it is important for any company, you know, including Microsoft or any other company, uh, to be uh, aware of not just their own emissions but also the emissions that are coming through their supply chain, All right? So, so this is what, um, uh, what companies are telling us, that they need a calculator and they need uh, a lot of help in accessing, in understanding and in calculating and in, 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 in collecting data for analysis uh, so that they can meet the, 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 the standards. Uh, and, and, and a lot of their suppliers are struggling on, on, on meeting science-based targets or, or setting uh, are struggling with the, the making sense of the the uh, carbon emission and and so on. So this 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 function allows um, our users um, and our system based on based on the the emission numbers 
say for example, uh, if if the number has gone over uh, in, in, in the near future, every company will be given a tax, a particular carbon number, uh, you know, amount that, 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 that they are legally allowed to emit. Uh, anything that, that, that goes beyond that, a uh, company will have to look for ways to, uh, ways to reduce their emission. And one possible way uh, is to go to the carbon offset market and to, to purchase and to offset the, uh, the extra uh, emission, the extra carbon emissions that the company, that, that the company ha is responsible. Uh, likewise, uh, companies who is doing better than expected or better than what legally was, they, they can also put their, 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 their credit, carbon credit, online in a marketplace like this. And, and, and those who are in need of, you know, a carbon offset or carbon credit, they can, they can actually uh, um, uh, purchase and they can actually, uh, um, um, and so companies who offer this as, as carbon credits can actually benefit from it. Uh, one of the very, uh, very recently, very, very well known, very well talked about uh, was, uh, was a Tesla. So Tesla last year alone makes millions and millions of dollars from selling carbon credits. Uh, and so uh, what's really happening in this particular space is this carbon credit, carbon upset, carbon exchange uh, is fast becoming a, a one of the one of the one of the um, uh, one of the financial one of the investment areas. There are a lot of uh, stock exchanges and a lot of uh, financial institutions are looking at. Uh, it is. It is Envisage that uh, going forward, um, it will uh, it will create a, a brand new economy, if you were, um, um, uh, not just in terms of uh, companies trying to trying to to to, to purchase and, and and offset their emissions. Uh, individuals like ourselves uh, will be encouraged to offset some of our digital footprints, and so so both in terms of business as well as individual, um, uh, it, it is it is believed that the the carbon carbon uh, trading or carbon offset uh, marketplace would be a very interesting uh, new economy. Um, um, so our, our system, our system would have functionalities on, as, uh, say for example, if you have three hundred thousand, let's say three hundred tons to, to offset, uh, and what it would do is it will, uh, it will, uh, you, it will allow you to go shopping if you were, you can go to our marketplace. And you can actually uh, find out more about what each of the projects is about. I believe I have a screenshot next. Say for example, this one. This is uh, this is our real project, Winston Creek project, and it, it's in Lewis County in the U.S. And 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 this project speaks to SDGs four, six, thirteen, and fifteen. And it is it's 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 it, and each ton is it's uh, it's been costed at one hundred and twelve USD. And you can actually uh, buy, and, and and you can add to cart, and you can then do your offset calculations. Uh, and, and and the idea is to um, to to figure out how much how how many how many times are you are you trying to offset, and also how much are you going to spend on if you were to offset those projects that you have. So again, our system allows uh, users, company users, to plan, or 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 those in classrooms, uh, students can learn about the, the, the uh, more than 200 projects that we have uh, already recorded and picked up in our system. So it, it, it gives uh, users a lot of uh, opportunities to learn about different types of carbon, uh, carbon offset projects, ranging from bio-related to uh, deforestation to uh, you know, regenerative agriculture and so on. Okay, um, and, and just before the talk, um, last couple of days, I thought we'll make this uh, kind of relevant to our audience today, um, that, that you know, we pulled up this uh, uh, ESG uh, rep reports and we kind of put them side by side. And this is one example of how uh, you, our users will be able to uh, track. And, and, and so we want to have things like what they have disclosed and we'll have their focus area and we will also have analysis that looked at how they are, uh, how what what the initiatives are doing and how are they converted into SDG goals, right? Uh, and then we will have uh, we will have the highlights, you know, the areas that that they are good at, the areas that they have had good initiatives. We will also have what is called opportunities, right? So the opportunities are the areas 
that they haven't had any, uh, uh, you know, any uh, uh, initiatives that have reported. So just one a quick glance uh, of the two, you can say you can see that there are more uh, areas uh, that that needs to be worked on. Uh, if we just do compare these two, but once you click on it, there will be more details, and we have a recommendation button here that would uh, that would push all all the best practices uh, in terms of initiatives that that the uh, this bank uh, Islamic Bank hasn't had any. So um, um, you know the, the the planner of Islamic Bank will be able to learn from our recommendation, right? And 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 that's basically uh, what what we're doing. Um, sorry, Professor Pan, we're running out of time. I have five more minutes before I need to say stop the the presentation. Can I just ask you to within the next thirty seconds conclude? Unfortunately, we do not have any more time. Yeah, perfect, because this is the last slide. So perfect timing. Um, so just to wrap up, um, so in, 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 in our research at the Digital Sustainability Hub, you know, here in Sydney, uh, from a business school, from a business uh, research point of view, we're, we're, to, we're really seeing two opportunities. And we're looking at how organizations are responding to, to ESG, you know, responding to circular economy. One, for example, is this whole notion of ESG-led growth, right? So how can how can organization benefit uh, in terms of growth, in terms of value creation, and in terms of differentiation strategies? So there's there's been a lot of focus. You know, companies are uh, 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 dishing out, companies are developing uh, new ES e new ESG-centric strategies. Um, they're developing, they're disclosing. Uh, and 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 they are they are they are now measuring. There has been a lot of quantitative uh, um, uh, the analysis that that measures and benchmark uh, company you know uh, company A uh, with company B. The second opportunity that we are seeing is this whole notion of circular economy, and more particular focusing on GAG emissions as well as decarbonization transformation. I think what uh, what we have heard from uh, earlier. Uh, a, a, a three of the three of a three of three of our speakers they have uh, they have wonderful inventions they are all aimed at you know contributing to this whole notion of decarbonization and i think that's 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 another area that uh, business business you know business leaders uh, will have to start thinking about how they can apply circular strategies to materials to 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 emission hotspots uh, and and how 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 they can through transformation how can they slash some of the excessive material consumption, and hopefully thereby uh, by by uh, thereby reducing uh, GHGs. So with that, I will um, stop and um, right. yeah, I'll, yeah. Professor Ben, thank you. I unfortunately I I literally from my side thank you so much for this presentation. As um, one of our professors uh, at the UAU said at the College of Business Economics, it's a timely system um, for us to, 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 to measure what's being done. Because the reality is, um, if you don't measure it, it doesn't get managed or actually doesn't get done. So um, hopefully this one will, the, your, your system, your, your, your index will contribute to this. Just a quick question. It's a yes or no. Um, do we and would you foresee having kind of a country or city or industry benchmarks that I can compare myself on an, an, on an industry average or a city average or a country average? Um, um, would your system provide for that? Yeah, so the, 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 there are now a lot of standards. Um, I think Anita, uh, Anita um, uh, had covered a little bit. There are a lot of disclosure standards. Uh, so what the international audience or international practitioners are trying to do is to develop uh, one standard, so that that's an ongoing conversation. When I say standard, I meant the the the, the approach and the, the way to disclose what companies are doing. So the disclosure um, the disclosure is coming really coming from the the stock exchanges, and, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, ways of doing it. Um, you know, uh, some people counted that there are more than thirty different international standards. No, um, my, so, my question, mm, Professor, mm, is um, are yeah. we going to have, for example, I am at a certain level. How do I compare on that level against what's happening in my city, in my country, in my industry? 
not necessarily the standard, but on a specific standard, my score for argument's sake. If yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think across industry, it's 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 possible. That's what we're doing. Our system, our system does have the uh, the industry centric, so you can compare five supermarkets, right? You can compare five, you know, uh, power power stations, you know, if you were. Uh, so that's possible. Sorry, and, I will. I will also add into this, there are um, tools that are available to general public as well, simpler tools that is um, friendly to the, um, let's say, normal user that wants to see. There are tools like in UAE, we have, uh, Diwa has a tool in their application. So when you pay your bill, you can see how well you did compared to your neighbors, compared to what you did last year, last month, and it makes you become aware of the fact that, uh, you know, why is the water running while you're brushing your teeth? Something as simple as that. So the tools are there, we just need to find them. And then also the sophisticated tools that Professor Shan was talking about is available for uh, industry and um, it is coming across and even at this part of the world, which is following, uh, there is going to be accountability that's coming into place. So we are going to have to start to realize what our footprint is, what we're doing, and we need to make these changes slowly, uh, a little bit faster, but slowly, one at a time. You know, sorry, I, I cut you off there. I didn't yeah, mean no, to do no. that. Thank you for sharing. All right. right. Now, I think with that, uh, thank you so much for, for both of you for your, for your um, inputs on that. We have unfortunately ran out of time. Uh, my commitment was for an hour and a half. Um, uh, uh, Anita, there's something that I have to ask you. Plastic, you spoke about plastic. And other parts of the world, we're finding entrepreneurs taking plastic, they're making bricks of it. They're making clothing of it. They're making, um, this is plastic waste. They, they're using it for as an input in, into tarmac. Um, is, is, is this something we're seeing in the UAE? or is it still something that is future music? So um, it is something that we're seeing. Uh, personally, I'm, uh, I, I support fully plastic to be used, reused in industry for bricks, for uh, anything like that. As for it going into clothing, I'm not such a huge fan of that because uh, when you wash your clothes, you're bleeding microplastics uh, into the water and everything has plastics and um, uh, it, it, it's, we're living in a, what there was a song, pla material world, plastic world, I don't know, but mm -hmm. uh, we are becoming plastic. So uh, we should be careful using it uh, in road base, uh, in bricks, in um, making more water oh. bottles. We don't need to make more plastic. We have enough yeah. for running around to do that. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm, we've run out of time. Uh, we could have used another half an hour or an hour at the very least. Uh, please, from my side to our speakers, um, thank you so much for your willingness to share your stories, um, to share your time, you busy people, all of you. And um, I, I would really want to, to sort of follow this up with visits to your uh, uh, businesses, your enterprises to go and see, and, and where possible, bring group from abroad, student group from abroad to come and see what it is that you're doing and how you're doing it. And um, Professor Pan, I think we need to chat again about how we can take your, your, your index further, because I think it leads to a lot of sophisticated, sophisticated uh, measurements. Um, I understand that there are uh, 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 more simpler ones that one can use for us as normal consumers, organizations I do think need to look forward. And I'm absolutely thrilled with what you're doing, Dr. Nicholas, um, because I'm uh, at my home, I only have, uh, this is now my home back in South Africa, um, I only use solar, uh, and but I can use three huge batteries to make sure I get energy tonight. And as I said earlier on, on, on a micro and a nano level, that's doable, but not really on a utility scale, which is where your, I think your, your system kicks in beautifully. Um, so thank you once again from my side to um, our uh, delegates that have registered and listened to these experts. Uh, thank you so much for your time um, and for your willingness to, to log in and, and listen to our experts. Um, it is our uh, privilege to be hosting this kind of thing. So, uh, 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And all the best. And I look Thank forward, you. as I said, visiting you. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, Thank the you. solution is out there. We just need to find it and do it and implement it, really. I agree. It's not, Thank we're you. not inventing the wheel. The wheel is already there. Yeah, indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.